The recent escalation in Israel and Palestine is an episode in a series that's been taking place for over a century. What happened on the 7th of October did not begin on the day, it began long before. This time, as in many other episodes, it started in Gaza, an open-air prison, besieged city that has a population of just over 2.1 million people, 1.7 million of which are refugees. Some were forced out of their homes during the 1948 ethnic cleansing campaign, what is also known as Plan Dalit, an implementation of a Zionist plan to wipe off as many Palestinians to have a Zionist majority country and build what is now Israel. More refugees fled to Gaza in 1967 following Israel's war with Arab nations. In 2005, Israel withdrew from Gaza. Political analysts claim that this was a tactic by then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to divide Gaza and the West Bank, therefore reducing the chances of establishing a Palestinian state alongside Israel. A year later, elections took place in Gaza and the West Bank to choose a government for the Palestinian Authority, an authority with limited responsibilities across certain areas in the West Bank and Gaza. These elections were internationally monitored and received the stamp of approval from multiple bodies. One person who physically oversaw these elections and wrote long reports about their transparency was the previous American president, Jimmy Carter. They were viewed as the most democratic elections the Arab region has seen in recent history up to that time. The Palestinian movement Hamas, or short for Harakat al muqawma al islamiyah the Islamic resistance movement, won by a landslide. This came as a shock to many people, many parties, internal political rivals, Israel and global powers. Israel and its allies, led by the US, gave Hamas conditions to recognize their government as legitimate with typical arrogance and supremacy, disregarding democracy altogether. These conditions included handing many political positions to political rivals. To their surprise, Hamas agreed to some of these conditions, however not all of them, as they intervened with what they considered crucial sovereignty matters. Following this, Israel's allies in the Gaza Strip began conducting orchestrated terrorist attacks to take Hamas down and hold power. They failed, particularly after Hamas ordered their military wing, Az al-Din al-Qassam brigades, to take down the terrorist rebellion. Israel and its allies were not pleased and took a decision to take down the democratically elected government by force through external intervention after they failed internally. Israel immediately implemented a full siege on Gaza in the hope that this would take them down. They failed. They went on a bloody war in 2008 that took thousands of innocent Palestinians' lives and left tens of thousands injured, totally destroying Gaza infrastructure. They failed again. They had another war in 2012. However, that was limited, as the newly democratically elected government in Egypt showed clear support to the Palestinians at the time. They even sent their Prime Minister to Gaza as a sign of clear solidarity. So that also failed. In 2014, Israel went on a full-scale war again. They had no resistance from Egypt at the time following military coup that was supported by Israel and its allies. Egypt is a key player as it has borders to the south of Gaza. In addition, Hamas had tense relations with the new Egyptian regime, the same one that took down the previous democratically elected Muslim Brotherhood government, led by late President Mohamed Morsi, who died prematurely while in Egyptian prison. During the 2014 war that went on for 51 days, Israel killed over 2,000 Palestinians, injured over 10,000, misplaced hundreds of thousands and destroyed the already destroyed Gaza yet again. 
However, when it came to taking down Hamas, again, they failed. Ever since, there have been numerous escalations between Gaza and Israel, where many people lost their lives. However, as Israel comprehended its inability to take down Hamas, they started having minor deals with them in return for short-term ceasefires, ones that Israel repeatedly broke. Hamas has, at many times, offered Israel long-term truce. However, Israel rejected this. Israel also failed to offer the Palestinian Authority any diplomatic solutions in the West Bank. This is an ongoing Israeli policy of conflict management, whilst keeping the Palestinians suppressed and subject to their brutal regime. Particularly in Gaza, the West Bank and Jerusalem. Going back to Gaza, in short, the Palestinian people of Gaza are natives of historical Palestine who are barred from returning to their homeland in modern-day Israel. Israel allows Jewish people to become residents, even if they have no connection to it whatsoever, yet ban refugees who live miles away from their hometowns and cities to return to them. The Gazans have been living under siege since 2006 with limited water, limited electricity, limited resources. It's an open-air prison. As of 2020, 70% of Gazans under 30 were unemployed. 53% of the population lived below the poverty line. 80% relied on external aid to survive. 27% of families lived in homes that are hazardous to their health. 68% of the population can't be sure where their next meal is coming from. Anyone under the age of 17 knows nothing but Gaza, the big open-air prison. All of this is due to Israel, that would rather spend billions on surrounding Gaza with walls, bombing it, rather than billions trying to provide the people of Gaza with basic life necessities. Israel reportedly showed its unwillingness to reach a solution with the Palestinians. The only Israeli PM who was about to take a genuine step to reach a solution was Itzhak Rabin, who was assassinated in 1995. The culprit who sits in prison and took the blame for the assassination, Yigal Amir, was a right-wing extremist and was backed by right-wing movements. Some of its supporters sit in the current Israeli government. There were also suspicions raised about his death, and some political analysts in Israel claim it was orchestrated by the deep state in Israel that has direct links with the US, who had no interest in seeing a solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians. After all, it's the chaos in the Middle East that makes money for US corporations, not stability. Death Blood and destruction is what makes the military-industrial complex money, not peace. With no hope in the horizon, the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have nothing to lose. All of them have already lost either a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a child, a baby, a relative, a house, or even worse, a big combination of these. The children of the refugees that Israel brutally forced out and refuses to take back. The bereaved. The prisoners of Gaza. Those are the people who broke the walls, sailed the seas, and took the sky. The people that Israel always ignores and wishes would somehow disappear into the sea hoping it would wash them away and maybe wash away its dark, bloody sins with them. And now they talk about terrorism, that cursed magic stick that they use whenever they themselves want to commit crimes against humanity, as they have done in many parts of the world. That same cursed magic stick that they use to psychologically instill fear in the subconscious minds of the masses, hoping that they would refrain from supporting just, humane causes. Terrorism means the use of force, bullying, harassment, 
or killing as means to achieve political or ideological gains. Israel forcibly removed one million Palestinians from their lands in 1948 and 1967 and still forces people out of their lands by doing just that, terrorism. Israel killed over 100,000 Palestinians since the beginning of the conflict and still does by doing that, terrorism. Israel is the terrorist and Israel is what is condemned. The irony is the same people who want us to label the oppressed as terrorists are the followers of those who one day called Nelson Mandela a terrorist and supported South African apartheid against the black South Africans, the descendants of Winston Churchill and his ideology that they value so much. The same Churchill that called Palestinians, quote, barbaric hordes, the same Churchill who said, quote, I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with beastly religion, end quote. The same Churchill that held strong Aryan race supremacy beliefs, similar to you know who. In 1937, Churchill even told the Royal Palestinian Commission, quote, I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to those people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, or at any rate a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. I do not admit it. The same people who kneel to this man's statue and kiss his shoe are the same people condemning the Palestinians and showing support to Israel. Zionism and its masters in the West do not want peace between Israelis and Palestinians. They do not want peace between the Jewish, the Muslim, and the Christian communities. The price is paid primarily by the Palestinians, but also by Israelis. Innocent Israeli civilians pay the price of the Israeli war machine and those who run it remotely. The Palestinians, unlike what you've been told by mainstream media and lamestream online figures, are people who simply want to live in peace but are consistently met with war. They want equality but always face supremacy. They want rights and all they get is liabilities. The Palestinians simply want to break free from prison and shout their suffering out loud to the world in the hope that it may, once and for all, give them the rights that they fully deserve.